Okay, we might start. Welcome everybody and thank you for coming this evening to this event where we're celebrating Anthea Roberts' book. Um, for those of us to whom Brexit and Trump were a shock and Le Pen was a dodged bullet, we've learnt the dangers of living in a bubble, at least domestically. Um, but as international lawyers, it seems that we're at risk of doing the same thing internationally. Now there's influential movements such as third world approaches to international law or TWAIL, feminist approaches to international law or FAIL, at least that's how it feels sometimes. <laughs> um, these have exposed us to the biases and the blind spots in international law. Anthea Roberts, and I'm going to, going to call it a critique, um, is more per pervasive still. Um, indeed, in many respects, Anthea has exposed um, that international law is in fact a myth in some respects. I don't think it goes too far um, to say that international law will never be quite the same again for many of us after reading this book. As international lawyers, we will have to rethink our international credentials. Now at LSE we take great pride in our diversity, um, both of our student body, our researchers and indeed our research. But in preparation for today's, tonight's seminar, I took the Anthea Roberts Challenge and I had a quick scan through our undergraduate international law course and in particular the essential readings. And the results were shocking. Overwhelmingly UK and US based authors. And then of course the Finn was in. So Marty Koskinyemi, always the exception <laughs> to the rule. Uh, but that, I, I, I was frankly shocked here at LSE that our reading list, is, that I'm talking about our essential reading list, uh, was so lacking internationality. And indeed it, it, it recalled for me um, a couple of years ago a confused undergraduate international law student coming up to me and asking, um, is international law the law of Australia? And I thought, what an odd question, until I realised that every single lecturer, at the time it was Susan Marks, Andrew Lang, myself and Chris Thomas lecturing, every single lecturer he had had in international law had been from Australia. Now, um, in terms of diversity though, and indeed esteem, our panel uh, this evening cannot disappoint. Uh, we are privileged that Anthea um, has come to speak to us about her book. Uh, Anthea is currently an associate professor at Regnet, uh, which is the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the ANU in Canberra. Um, she was, of course, we are proud to say, though formerly a, a lecturer at LSE, of course she was, she's Australian, um, <laughs> and she also taught at Harvard and Columbia. We are also thrilled to have with us Ryan Mullison. Uh, he has been, again, at LSE, formerly as a visiting centennial professor, uh, but is currently research professor at the University of Tallinn. I also just wanted to highlight uh, Ryan Mullison's recent book, um, Geopolitics and the Clash of Ideologies, Dawn of a New Order, which has just come out and is one of 13 books uh, that Ryan has published in his career. Um, his credentials, uh, I, I read just to, to establish our diversity. Uh, he um, was the first Deputy Foreign Minister of Estonia, um, also, of course, um, spent some time through his life in the Soviet Union and was uh, international law advisor to Gorbachev. Um, he was the UN Regional Advisor for Central Asia, uh, the member of the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, President of the Institut de Droit International, uh, and prof Professor of International Law as well at King's College London. Marko Milanovic, I say with an Italian accent for some reason, <laughs> uh, grew up in Serbia. Um, Marko um, was, was indeed educated at the University of Belgrade, uh, then at um, the University of Michigan, uh, and did his PhD at the University of Cambridge. Um, he's currently at the University of Nottingham as an associate professor, um, and we will, many of us know him, of course, uh, through EGIL Talk. Um, he's, I think you're the some president of, of ESOL in some capacity or vice. Vice. vice, vice. Just, always the bridesmaid. Um, <laughs> so, um, we are, That's as true. ever, delighted to have Marco with us. What a, an amazing panel, and it will kick off with Anthea introducing her book to us. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the warm introduction. And this is actually my first time back at the LSE uh, since I left being um, a teacher here. And I, I've always absolutely loved the LSE. 
very much for the diversity of both the student body but also the professors. But I have to say, Devika is right. When I did the study of the uh, UK international lawyers, they were by far the most <coughs> internationalised as in not being from from the UK, but about half of them were actually Australian, and so there is a piece in the works at some point about the Australian mafia in international law, if anybody wants to give me insight. So this book uh, asks the question, is international law international? And it's a question that's a little bit different to the question we usually ask ourselves, which is, is international law law? And that's because I, I started, as I moved around to a number of different countries, I started to feel that the assumption that we all had that international law might not, that international law was international, might not actually be correct. I had sort of very much started from the assumption that we had comparative domestic law because we assumed domestic laws of different states would be similar or different and could be compared. But I'd never really asked that question of international law because once it was international, I sort of assumed it would be universal and applicable with all states. But as I started to move around and study and teach and work in the US, the UK and Australia, I started to ask myself questions about that because I started to realise that there were very different communities of international lawyers in different states that were trained in different ways, focused on different issues, and I felt had distinct approaches to international law. And then I became very aware that that was me moving around between three English-speaking Western common law states, which made me start to wonder how different might it look in states outside my sort of field of vision. Uh, in this case, I also wanted to look particularly at Russia and China. And in starting to ask this question of whether international law is not so much whether it's law, but whether it's international, I focused around three different issues. I focused around whether there were different national or regional approaches to international law of different communities of international lawyers. I then focused on a question of dominance, whether there were some national or regional approaches to international law that had really come to dominate what we understood as being the international. And finally, I started to observe patterns of disruption, things about changing technology or changing geopolitics that might disrupt some of these patterns of dominance and difference that we've seen today. The best way I can describe this project, really, is through an analogy with language, which is international law kind of sells itself as Esperanto. Esperanto was a constructed auxiliary language designed to allow communication, equal communication between people from different language backgrounds. But of course, Esperanto has never really taken off internationally. Instead, the reality of what we have around the globe is a combination of two things. On the one hand, we have multilingualism, which means that we have different communities of native speakers in different parts of the world where there's much more communication within languages than between language groups. And we don't know whether we're all saying the same things in different languages or different things in different languages. That on the one hand, which is a pattern of difference, and on the other hand, we have English as the world's lingua franca, which is not something that everybody speaks, but it's the most common go-to international language. And that's very much like what I speak about in terms of the idea of dominance, that some national or regional approaches become the international approaches. Now, when I wanted to study this idea of whether there were different communities of international lawyers, I obviously, obviously had to identify which international lawyers I was going to look at and which states. So let me start with the states. Obviously, with this sort of a study, you would want to study many different types of states horizontally and greater depth uh, vertically. But there are only limits to what one can do. So I chose to focus on the five members of permanent members of the Security Council. And that was partly because these states are, are privileged in the international system, uh, play a very important role in the international system, but it was also partly because they were similar and different on a number of dimensions. So we had Western and non-Western, we had English speaking and non-English speaking, we had civil law and common law. We had a variety of sort of differences, liberal, democratic and authoritarian, a variety of differences that made them an interesting group to study. But we also, in doing that, clearly have blind spots. So if you focus on the five members of the Security Council, you don't see a lot of the core periphery dynamics which end up becoming very important in international law. You miss out on Latin America, you miss out on Africa. So by no means is this an exhaustive study, but I think it actually tells you some indicative things that are interesting to consider further afield. The other reason the UN Security Council was interesting for this study is we are really entering into an era, and you can tell this with the national security strategy of the US, where <laughs> geopolitics is back. And we're starting to see some very interesting standoffs happening between some of the states on the Security Council. But having chosen these five states to study to ask this question, I also needed to focus on a particular group of international lawyers. Now, it's very hard to study the profiles and backgrounds and approaches of uh, international lawyers working for government. You just can't get that information easily. 
but it's relatively easy to find out information about the profiles and backgrounds and approaches of international law academics. And so in this study, I chose to focus primarily on international law academics, recognizing that often the patterns are very similar with the communities of international academics in the state and with other international lawyers from that state. Not always, and we'll find some, we'll find some examples where that's not the case. But by studying these academics, I could start to tell certain patterns about what made for commonalities of international lawyers. So where did they study? What languages did they tend to read and publish in? And what did they teach? <coughs> and in looking at what they taught, I focused on the textbooks from these different states to see what it was about what the, the international subject that we were trying to teach to the next generation. What was similar and what was different? And these are also things that really form part of the bread and butter of international law. So academics become a subsidiary source of international law, their textbooks become a source of international law. So I wanted to see, are we teaching the same thing or are we teaching something different? Now there are many aspects to this book, so I'm just going to introduce three briefly. The first is what I'm calling the divisible college. The second is an introduction to some of the textbook issues. And the final is a competitive world order. So let me start with the first point which is, as international lawyers, we love the idea that we exist in an invisible college of international lawyers. We are international lawyers dispersed throughout the world, yet engaged in a continuous process of, con of communication and collaboration. But as I started to move around, I became aware of very distinctly different communities of international lawyers that were often talking a lot to themselves, but very little to, to others that weren't as like them. And I could really see that very distinctly when I looked at educational profiles of where particular international lawyers studied, in some cases wholly within one country, in other cases transnationally but only between certain types of countries, and also where they chose to publish their articles. And these often created very distinct dialogues of international law. So one example I'll give you of this are the debates that were had about Crimea. Um, now, in the, in the Crimean debates, you saw on the one hand a very distinct community of Russian international lawyers having a very distinct Russian international debate about Crimea. And that wasn't surprising when I traced back that out of the international lawyers at their elite schools, about 98% had done their first law degree in Russia, their second law degree in Russia, and their third law degree in Russia, and published about 98% of their international law articles in the Russian language in Russian journals. Given that, it wasn't surprising you had a relatively self-contained debate. But the same was true of the West. Many of the people there had done, if not all of their law degrees in the one country, they had all done all of their law degrees primarily within the West. They published in the English language. They published in the Western journals. And they were having a completely different debate about Crimea. And you could even see this in the titles of the articles. The uh, Western ones were all about Russia's unlawful annexation of Crimea. And the Russian ones were largely about Crimea's right to self-determination and reunification with the mother country. But it wasn't just that you had these very different debates of international law going on, often with almost no communication between them, which goes to the bubbles that Davika was talking about. But this was also affected by different connections to practice and different incentives. So for example, what I found in, the, in America was not only had many of the American international lawyers only ever studied international law in America, but they then had a tendency to work for US judges, US district court judges, US uh, Supreme Court judges, to go and work for the US State Department, and to then go back and try and publish and work in US uh, universities in a way that made them very, very connected to US approaches to international law and much less co uh, uh, connected to foreign approaches to international law. You saw something very different in the UK and French international law academies. There, it was not at all common for the international lawyers to work for UK or French judges. It was not at all common for them to work, for example, for the UK Foreign Office. Uh, part of that is that people don't tend to cycle in and out of the government as much here in academia. But partly it was also because most of the uh, international lawyers from the UK are not actually UK nationals. Most of us have actually come from elsewhere, as you can see from some of us on the panel today. And instead, the UK and French international lawyers, instead of being very, very closely connected to a foreign relations law approach of their state, they tended to be disproportionately connected to transnational, international courts and tribunals. So the ICJ, for example, and this is just to give you one ex illustration. These are uh, all of the professors that have appeared before the ICJ in the last 20 years. And you can see a pattern of both Western in general, and particularly the two big ones, UK and France. That's really something that you see very much in the, the profile of the UK and French international lawyers. But it wasn't just connections to practice, it's also incentives. And so one of the examples of incentives I want to give you about how they shape different communities of international lawyers is actually from the Chinese government. 
So the Chinese government actually has recommended topics of research each year, including recommended topics of international law research. And so I started coding what is it that the Chinese government is recommending for research and what are they actually funding. And, this give, and then I started to divide them up between different areas. And this gives you an idea, which is a very, very strong focus on international economic law, then on law of the sea, post-2009, I wonder why, and then international environmental law. And one of the interesting things about that is after that, it's almost flatlined. There's, there's very little being incentivized on a whole bunch of other topics. And this is a very interesting contrast, for example, to the United States, where you have a huge number of the international law professors doing US foreign relations law, doing international criminal law, international law and domestic courts, use of force, laws of war. Those are almost not featured in, in terms of what's specialised in Chinese approaches to international law. And yet many of the things that are really specialised in the Chinese approaches to international law, you almost can't find at the US law schools. So, for example, in the last 30 years, there have been almost no hires in law of the sea in any of the top law schools and, and relatively limited hires in some of the international economic law areas as well and international environmental law. So we can see these very distinct uh, groupings of international lawyers that sometimes actually... Uh, have expertise that completely don't match, even though in the next generation that's going to be a real issue. But it's not just about the different communities of international lawyers, it's also about the, what it is that we communicate international law to be to you. So one of the things that had led me to this project was when I first went to start teaching in the US at Harvard, I needed to set a US cases, uh, well, I needed to set an international law textbook and I chose not to set the one I'd had here at the, in the, uh, at the LSE. Because I thought, look, it, it's all international law, but I'll use a US case as a materials book because they'll be more used to the US case-based method. So I sent this book, and I suddenly was in front of a class of you know, almost 100 um, students in first year every week teaching cases from the US Supreme Court that I'd never read before. And I remember finding it really kind of odd because I didn't think that the US... A Supreme Court was the oracle in international law and after reading these cases I also thought it was not a particularly good student of international law. Um, and so I thought well this seems very odd to me but, but maybe it's just because I'm not used to these domestic cases, maybe I'm just noticing it for that reason. Maybe it's not as domestic as I think. So I started to actually code, for example, uh, all the cases that are referred to in the main textbooks, the main three to five textbooks from these different states. And one of the things I was looking for is how domestic are they, which is the red, how much are they by international courts and tribunals, which is the blue, and how much are they by foreign uh, courts and tribunals. And it turns out, no, I was not imagining it. The American ones were overwhelmingly full of American case law. And, and that was completely distinct from what I found in any of the other case books. You contrast that, for example, to the Chinese textbooks, and in the five that I looked at there, uh, there was not a single domestic Chinese case. Um, and so whereas the US books sort of subtly give the impression that international law is what we do, uh, the Chinese ones almost subtly gave the impression that international law is kind of what others do, and let's keep it at an arm's length. Whereas with the French textbooks, the subtle impression that was created was basically like, it's us and the ICJ and nothing else matters. <laughs> Which is quite like many of the French international lawyers I know. Um, but what, that could just be string citations, right? That might that would actually be the, the, the sort of real meat of what was happening in the textbook. So I started to look, for example, if I took all of the cases and actually looked at how often they were, or how many pages they were referred to in the book, you started to see these patterns quite dramatically. So, for example, this is a, a relatively standard UK international law textbook, and if you look at it, you'll see the biggest case here is Nicaragua and the US. But almost all of the large cases here are actually by international courts and tribunals, which is very much in keeping with what I think is the understanding of international law in the UK. It's not the foreign relations law of the UK. It's very focused on international courts and tribunals, like the professors are. And really, the only big domestic case you can see is Pinochet, which is down there. And after that, you can kind of see Jones, and after that, you can't really see UK cases because it's not considered to be the bread and butter of what international law is. This, by contrast, is probably the most domesticated of all of the American international law textbooks. And if you look at it, you will recognise it has the same big case, Nicaragua and US, which really is the intersection of the international courts and tribunals and the US foreign relations law approach because it's where the US was taken to the ICJ and refused the, to accept the jurisdiction and went home. But almost every other big case is actually a US foreign relations law case. It's, it's by US courts. And if you are looking at this thinking, I don't know most of those cases, you just try teaching them. <laughs> but then I ask myself, it's not just about kind of are you, are you teaching um, your own domestic cases. But when you are looking at cases generally, for example, how regionally representative are you being? How international are you being? As Davika said when she did it to their um, reading list. 
And so one of the things I looked at here to, to give you some sense of this is I looked at the UN regional groups. And I said, out of all of the domestic cases that are cited in these textbooks, how do they match up against the UN regional groups? And the key one to look at here is the yellow one, which is Western Europe and other. So I asked what percentage of the domestic cases we cite in our books come from the West, come from the yellow? And I would say, I'm not sure that that's a pie chart so much as a pie. <laughs> for France, that's 99.6%. For the US, that's 99%. And for the UK, that's stunning diversity at 96%. And once you start to realise that, you start to really question what it is that you are doing in terms of your understanding of the world. And you also start to realise that some of the metrics that we just take for granted as being obvious ways to approach international law, like domestic court decisions, actually render invisible really important parts of the world. Because China, for example, does a lot of practice in international law, just not through its courts. And so we need to start to think about how some of our very metrics skew our vision of the world. But it turns out it's not just the West that's privileged, but there's a very particular US and UK dominance. So if you look, for example, at all the foreign cases that are cited in these books, the UK looks primarily to yellow, which is the US. The US looks primarily to the UK, which is blue. And every other state I looked at pretty much looked predominantly just to these two states, the US and UK. And that ended up appearing across textbooks across a whole range of states. That very often it wasn't just Western in general, but it was very particularly Anglo-American uh, dominance in particular. And that also matches the Anglo-American dominance of law firms, it matches the Anglo-American dominance of universities in global um, rankings, and the Anglo-American dominance in, um, in journal articles. But it wasn't just about the cases that were, that were different or the same in these textbooks. It was also differences in many other things that I had never thought about. So, for example, when I started looking at the Russian textbooks, I was deeply amused to find that all of them had an entire chapter on the law of outer space. And it had never occurred to me that this was an important area before. And they often had more on the law of outer space than they did on international economic law, which I assumed to be extremely important. But I stopped laughing when I started to actually read some of these textbooks because I realised that they were actually saying something which was very important, which is that technological advancements have really moved on in space. We now have a lot of non-state uh, sorry, non -state actors getting into the space world, and yet regulation in space has largely stopped and has stopped for many decades. I also realised that some of the hot topics were very different in different states. So the hottest topic in Russia seemed to be whether or not the individual could be a subject of international law. And I started to realise that that, whilst it was a very big theoretical topic there, was actually a proxy war between those who were more Soviet-inspired, who wanted to hug back to a more state-friendly approach to international law, and those that were more Western-inspired and wanted to go towards the West. But I didn't just start to notice these differences about what was focused on, but I started to notice subtle narratives coming through underneath. So for example, with unilateral humanitarian intervention, I was very, very used to the narrative uh, that something like Kosovo was illegal but legitimate, and there might be an emerging norm in favor of unilateral humanitarian intervention. But if I went across to my Russian textbooks, I saw a very, very different narrative about the NATO use of force and NATO war criminals and the sort of alleged humanitarian intervention. But I also saw a very different sort of idea of who the good guys and who the bad guys are. So in the Western textbooks, there's very much a, you know, it's the West pushing on the development of international law and China and Russia that are being recalcitrant and stopping the development. Whereas if I go to the law of outer space that's featured in the Russian textbooks, it's actually the opposite story. And you've got China and Russia pushing for the development of international codes, and it's the recalcitrant West, and particularly the US, that refuses to demilitarize. I also found in these that often the Chinese textbooks said almost nothing about them. So whereas Kosovo had a, was a big deal in the Russian textbooks, Kosovo is almost not mentioned in the Chinese textbooks. It's almost like it didn't happen. You just get subtle vibes about um, that some states invoke new hegemonism, um, uh, sorry, hegemonic approaches, but, but really it's sort of very subtly done. But I also found interesting divisions within the West. So for example, in the, in the uh, US textbooks, you often had 20 or 30 pages on Iraq, the 2003 invasion, with very, very detailed going through all of the Security Council resolutions and trying to work out the argument and the US argument. And you, could, and you got to the end, and it wasn't that these textbooks told you this is lawful, uh, but, but it was clearly arguable. I mean, you would, you would be able to argue both sides, and it was sort of left with that impression. You go across to the French textbooks and you often had one or two pages and it would be under something like the illegal invasion of Iraq and it would basically say that the US and UK you know, tried to make an argument but they were wrong because there was no second resolution. And so you got a very different sense of which issues were open and closed, which ones were arguable and which ones were not. All right, so where does this leave me now? Well, where this leaves me now is to start to think that some of the patterns that we have of difference and also dominance that we have, that have really defined our approach to international law to date are, are really going to be coming under challenge in this next generation.
When I said that I was not aware of an idea of comparative international law, that was really because I studied international law not too long ago. I studied international law in the post-Cold War era where we had unipolar power and there was very much a universal query Western uh, Anglo-American idea of international law dressed as universal. But if I went back a generation earlier, there was the Cold War where you had bipolar power and you very clearly had a Western approaches to international law and a Soviet approaches. And so part of my thinking is that as we move into this new age where geopolitical power is changing and we're moving into a more multipolar world between unlike-minded great powers, that we're also going to be returning to an era where we need to have a better understanding of comparative international law. And I think we're seeing that starting to play out now. So, for example, we can see very clear differences between the approaches of China and Russia and the approaches of the US and UK on things like cybersecurity. And some of these differences aren't just about different interests, but really go to different approaches to international law. So, for example, you see the US and UK approach very much treats cyber as something like a global commons that everybody should be able to freely operate in. Whereas you very much see in the Russia and China side a much more balkanized idea of the internet that you should be able to be your sovereign state and cut off the internet from the world. And they actually even use concepts that are very reminiscent of the concepts they use in their textbooks that emphasize sovereignty of things like cyber sovereignty. It's a, it's a quite different conception of the international system. But you also see differences, for example, about how you would come about to have regulation. So I remember I told you that the, whether or not the individual was a, uh, had status in international law was a big issue in Russia. Well, you see very much the Chinese and Russian are saying we should have regulation and it should be an interstate treaty between states. Whereas the, uh, the West are like, no, let's have non-binding governance, let's have corporations at the table. Again, we see some quite distinct approaches to who, who gets to count when it comes to creating international law. We also see very different narratives about particular issues. So one of these ones would be, for example, the Chinese and Western approaches on the South China Sea. And we all know roughly what happened in that case. But what you saw in the Chinese commentaries and in the Western commentaries was a very different emphasis on the facts. So what you saw in a lot of the Western stuff really came, and, and you could see this in the media, an assumption that uh, it was in the rise of China and whether China was going to abide by the rule of law or was going to be an aggressive citizen to others within, the, uh, within in its region versus what you really saw in a lot of the, um, and then there was a big emphasis on the fact that they didn't turn up to, um, to the tribunal and they refused to participate in the case and they refused to recognise the judgement. You flip that over to the Chinese sources and you saw a very different narrative about how instead of being an aggressor, China has been the victim of a century of humiliation at the hands of the West and this was another example of the West not respecting it, that the tribunal itself was dominated by um, those from the West, that there was no jurisdiction and very long arguments about what why there was no jurisdiction. And so we saw a very sort of different narrative about kind of who was aggressive and who was the victim. But we also saw a really interesting uh, asymmetry in the exchange of um, information. So unlike in the Russian case with Crimea where there was, these were two se separate communities, what we saw here is that the Chinese international lawyers often do their first law degree in China, but they're incentivized to do their second and third law degree in the West. They're incentivized to publish in English. They're incentivized to publish in Western journals. And some of their main journals, like the Chinese Journal of International Law, is written in English. And that actually allowed a lot of the Chinese approaches to actually be communicated to the West, which you did not have with the Crimea approach. But the same was not happening in reverse. And there are a number of different reasons for that, including that most of the Western scholars can't write in Chinese, that they're not incentivized to publish in Chinese journals, and that there would also be censorship problems if they tried to. So we see some, some exchanges, but often in an asymmetrical basis. At the end of the project, when I asked myself, is international law international, I really started to notice very distinct patterns of difference around the world in the Divisible College of International Lawyer, uh, Lawyers. I noticed very distinct patterns of dominance, much like I'd seen with English as the lingua franca. And I also came to believe that we're going to be facing some pretty major disruption that require us to have a better understanding of the other in international law. And so at the end of the day, I haven't tried to give a prescription for what international law is or exactly where it should be going in the next generation because I think that there is going to be some real questions about that. But I think the first thing for us to do is to start to try and see international law and ourselves through the eyes of others. And that means that I think we need to make a much more concerted effort to diversify our perspectives, to diversify our sources, to diversify our networks, to diversify our reading lists, mm -hmm. so that we understand international law in a more three-dimensional way from different perspectives. And when I say that, I don't mean you always have to agree with everything you read. You may read the Chinese papers or you may read some of the Russian articles and you may disagree with them, and that is fine. 
But I think it is really important to understand the different perspectives and also to understand and use them as a mirror to turn back on yourself to see whether some of your assumptions should be challenged. And certainly my assumptions started to be challenged a lot through this project. So I, it, it's about opening up to a diversity of approaches and to hearing some of the approaches that haven't been heard sufficiently today, but also using that as a source of self-critique to uh, question your own assumptions and to question your own blind spots. And with that, I'll turn over to our other two speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm struck by much of what you said, but, but one aspect is this unipolarity that we, we live in and that, that many of us have sort of grown up as international lawyers in, but that not to be nostalgic for the Cold War, but the strange cosmology of the Cold War era that almost made space for pluralism which is perhaps a good point at which to bring Ryan in. Would you like to speak at the lectern or here? I would like to sit yep. here, but maybe turn off the projector, yeah. yeah. So. Does it work? You can hear me. So, so First, thank you for having me here today because 25 years ago approximately, or 26 years ago, I <coughs> came to the UK for the first time uh, and I lived here in this campus for two and a half years. So I was visiting Centennial Professor and my career in this country started from uh, here. And I am so nostalgic, I walked around, <laughs> and made, made photos, I didn't recognize the flat I li uh, lived in the director's flat doesn't exist anymore, uh, probably. I lived in the director's flat of uh, the LSC. So, now about uh, the book. Um, <laughs> this is, th this is uh, one of the rare books I have read from the cover to the cover. And uh, uh, about, what about uh, international law academic books? Probably for 10 years at least, I haven't done that. So I skipped over, I looked into the issues which uh, interest me, I need, uh, so, but I don't read uh, the whole book. So already this uh, series, uh, shows something that uh, um, uh, this book uh, is uh, exceptional uh, here. And uh, the last thing uh, you said probably what uh, inspired me uh, to say, you started that uh, you didn't have preconceived ideas about uh, this. Uh, uh, you had an open mind completely. And you came to certain conclusions which were, uh, were unexpected even for you, prob uh, probably. This is how a, re a research has be, uh, uh, to be done. Because now uh, we have a research ag agenda, of course, and we have to uh, have certain uh, results uh, so to satisfy uh, our sponsors mostly. But th this is exactly uh, an uh, excellent uh, exemplary uh, research project uh, and uh, therefore uh, I uh, hope that every international lawyer and not only international lawyer uh, reads it. So, and I felt also quite a lot of affinity uh, with um, many uh, ideas <coughs> you uh, developed in uh, your uh, book. Uh, they uh, by expressed my uh, this my, uh, uh, my my book uh, some of my articles and not expressed unfortunately I, I found that you had done it uh, better than I had uh, done uh, and uh, one th thing uh, uh, you mentioned Ukraine and the Crimea. Uh, I believe at the end of the 90, uh, 2014 or at the beginning of uh, 2015, I published an article in uh, the Chinese uh, Journal of International Law. Uh, probably the title was uh, Ukraine, uh, Victim of Geopolitics. And uh, 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 later I was in Mexico City and uh, I uh, was invited to give some uh, lectures in uh, local universities. And then uh, the foreign minister of Mexico wanted to see me. I was surprised uh, how, how so, so I was uh, then president of the Institute of International Law, but it was not sufficient uh, to be invited by the minister, uh, who, who was meeting at the same time President Erdogan uh, also. 
<coughs> but then I asked him, uh, why, why did you want to meet me? And it, hap uh, it had happened so that his uh, assistant had read my, read my article on uh, uh, Ukraine. And of course, uh, Mexico is uh, far from Ukraine, uh, and uh, it is not an urgent issue for them, probably. But uh, uh, their assistants had told that there is somebody who has a non-aligned approach uh, to this issue. So uh, that th this uh, you, you didn't take sides, uh, Ukrainian or Western, uh, the EU or Russian side. So you analyze from different uh, perspectives of uh, uh, this con conflict. And I believe uh, Antia has done uh, so through the whole book. Uh, giving uh, perspectives of uh, different uh, countries, uh, why uh, uh, academics uh, write uh, in such a manner uh, or uh, differently. So uh, I believe uh, such a uh, perspective is uh, very important. It's a perspective of a researcher, not an advocate, who uh, serves interests of uh, his or her clients. So we are, I have also <coughs> present, uh, represented clients before uh, the uh, uh, London Court of International Arbitration and uh, as a representative I defend interests of my uh, clients. But here uh, when I make my research, I am a researcher uh, and I want to be as unbiased as possible. We are, can never be completely unbiased, uh, certainly. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, many of uh, international uh, lawyers also um, uh, uh, write uh, more that, uh, that, uh, like advocates, uh, not as rich, uh, researchers. Uh, it, where we stand uh, depends very often, or practically always, uh, where one uh, sits, uh, of course. And in your book, you mentioned, for example, two of my uh, good friends. Uh, one of them is my countryman, uh, Lauri Malzo. And uh, Martin Koskeniemi, uh, my old uh, friend. Uh, so you see, uh, 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 Laurie Meltzer published a book maybe 10 years ago about, uh, it was about the Molotov Ribbentrop uh, back probably. And uh, Martin wrote a um, uh, preface uh, to this book. And it starts uh, from the word something like that. Uh, this is a quite good book. Uh, uh, though from the first page it is clear that this is written by an Estonian. Uh, so <laughs> but I worked uh, in this country uh, 18 years as professor at LSE and then at King's and <coughs> worked in Russia for long uh, years, uh, uh, some years, in a very few years in Estonia. And when I had retired from King's already and I was in, uh, at a conference in Germany, uh, then one German lawyer came to me uh, and saw my label, uh, Tallinn University, what are you doing there? I told him I am an Estonian. You are an Estonian? I have read almost your books and all your articles. I have never thought yeah, that you are an Estonian. When you wrote, uh, uh, read Martin Kotzkenemi, probably his name is very Finnish, of, of course. But otherwise, if you read, you don't know that he is uh, Finnish. So I believe it is very good. I don't like that when you uh, uh, read uh, about the conflict in the Balkans, you immediately from the first page see who is a Serb, who is a Croat. Not about uh, Marco. Uh, he, he is different, and I believe that's why he is here, uh, true. Now, now uh, and, uh, but, but almost all uh, the conflicts or uh, CRS conflicts in the world, uh, situations which are also analyzed in uh, your book, uh, they are not, uh, and they cannot be described in uh, white, black uh, terms. And I would like to, uh, uh, no, it is from my book, but not quite quoting myself, but uh, French uh, philosopher Luc Ferry. And uh, permit me uh, uh, to quote in uh, full, because it is, uh, in my opinion, very important, and it, is, uh, it uh, echoes uh, what you are writing about. The truth, in contrast to what the majority of small-scale moralists think, is that many bloody conflicts in today's world are tragic, in the sense of pre-tragedies, where the opposing sides represent not of the good and the evil, right or wrong, but quite legitimate, though different claims. Had I been a Western Ukrainian of Polish origin, 
I would have probably wanted my country to join the European Union and even NATO. However, had I been from East Ukraine, from, from a Russian-speaking family, I would have almost certainly wanted my country to be closely attached to Russia. Had I been a Palestinian boy of 15 from the occupied territories, I would without doubt be an anti-Semite. By contrast, an Israeli of the same age from Tel Aviv would almost certainly despise Palestinian organizations. I believe it's all very uh, true, and sadly it is so. I have been to Israel many times, spoken to Palestinians and to Israelis, and I believe it is uh, true. And for example, therefore, when I write about uh, uh, the Crimea, I use uh, usually this uh, slash uh, annexation reunification, because both uh, terms are legitimate, whether they are uh, lawful, but they are legitimate if you take uh, 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 different uh, perspectives. Uh, and uh, this book uh, does justice to different points of view, uh, tries to understand uh, uh, them, tries to explain uh, uh, their origin. Uh, and therefore it is an academic work uh, in the better term uh, of this uh, word. There are a lot of cases or situations uh, analyzed which uh, have interested me during my uh, long uh, career in international uh, uh, law uh, and international politics uh, as well. For example, the Alvarez Machain case. Uh, you start uh, your book with uh, this case or, or almost. Uh, I came across this um, uh, in 1992, summer 1992, in Aspen when I was invited to the Aspen Institute, and I dis uh, discussed this case with Justice Harry Blackman. I was so uh, honored, I believe he, uh, he was one of the greatest uh, justices of the US Supreme uh, Court. And there, uh, uh, I was surprised that how uh, meticulously uh, US uh, authorities uh, 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 observed their domestic law using uh, the Miranda, uh, Miranda formula, for example, uh, when uh, taking over this um, uh, uh, doctor. Uh, probably, uh, I, there's no time to go into uh, the case. Uh, so, but the, do the doctor was kidnapped uh, on the territory of Mexico in violation of Mexican sovereignty. And this was not a point for the Supreme Court of the US. It was a minor uh, issue. What was important that uh, he was uh, uh, taken over by, uh, in accordance with the US uh, laws, no, no, notwithstanding that there was a, a clear violation of international uh, law, uh, such an offhand uh, approach uh, to international law. Uh, and uh, Anthea puts, uh, in my opinion, correctly uh, current uh, uh, developments in international law and future even developments in inter, uh, international uh, law um, in uh, this uh, changing uh, geopolitical uh, um, structure of uh, the world. So I have uh, very little time, but on page 179, I omit uh, um, uh, uh, quoting uh, that uh, you speak about uh, it uh, in a very uh, clear uh, term. In my opinion, really, the world is uh, in uh, the process of, and international law in the process of revolutionary uh, change. It started with uh, the uh, demise of the bipolar international system, the Cold War international system, a uh, unipolar moment a decade of the 1990s, uh, uh, then emergence of uh, multipolar elements, and now I believe there is uh, this struggle between two vi major visions in the world, a multipolar and, uh, let's say, the continuation of the unipolar Western, uh, uh, the American-led uh, 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 international uh, system. And international law in the 1990s also reflected uh, it. When I came to teach at the LSE, I taught international criminal law. In 1992, had, I had probably 10 students. In 1993, I had hundreds of students because of this uh, explosion of uh, interest uh, towards international uh, criminal uh, law, the creation of uh, the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals. 
Also, uh, there was uh, the responsibility to protect the uh, privacy of international uh, uh, human rights uh, law and democracy uh, promotion of uh, such principles of international law as non-interference and non-use of uh, force. Uh, 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 but I already felt then that something was wrong because international criminal law uh, is really very fit uh, for international uh, relations. Inter international relations, especially interstate relations, are per se uh, political relations. And criminal law doesn't even, domestic criminal law is not, not very well dealing uh, with uh, such uh, political uh, relations. And then humanitarian intervention uh, <coughs> was very popular well, uh, uh, responsibility uh, to protect. But here I would like to uh, quote uh, 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 from uh, uh, the uh, Tallinn uh, session of the Institute of International Law in 2015 uh, when uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, body of 130 appro approximately international lawyers came to the conclusion that uh, international uh, law doesn't allow unilateral uh, humanitarian intervention without being authorized by the Security Council. So there was such, uh, uh, in the 1990s, uh, probably uh, such a uh, uh, tendency uh, uh, but uh, by 2015, clearly, most international lawyers and uh, the uh, rapporteur of the uh, commission uh, was uh, Michael, um, uh, Michael, no, 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 Oh, one of the most Yale school oh, oh, Reisman. Reisman. Michael Reisman, who had been uh, uh, an advocate of humanitarian invent intervention before, but uh, these failed interventions uh, 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 led him also to think uh, uh, differently. Uh, and of course, there are so many interesting issues, and the last one you mentioned, uh, uh, cybersecurity, information security, I believe this is uh, the real uh, problem uh, now. And uh, you know, as the uh, uh, very uh, beginning when uh, uh, the internet uh, started its uh, rapid development, then it, uh, the understanding was it would undermine uh, authoritarian uh, uh, governments, regimes. Now, now it has been different. On the contrary, uh, it is working against uh, many democratic uh, countries. And I know also why, if uh, there is uh, time for questions, I, uh, I would like to uh, speak about uh, it uh, also. And I like your uh, approach here, you uh, referring to the Thailand manual on cybersecurity. You uh, mentioned like-minded states, like-minded states. Are. So this is one of the problems. Uh, pe like-minded people, like-minded states uh, come together, but they can't resolve uh, uh, these issues without non-like-minded uh, states. So most important thing is, for example, not uh, uh, for uh, Merkel, Merkel or uh, Trump to, uh, Macron and Trump to discuss uh, Syria, but to discuss it with Russia. So the, uh, with Iran, uh, with Turkey, and uh, so on, who are not like-minded. Then you can, otherwise you are like, uh, there is a Russian joke. Uh, so true uh, drunkards, uh, they drink and uh, they uh, discuss, uh, then you respect me. Yes, I respect you. And do you respect me? Yes, I respect you. It means we are respected people. So <laughs> uh, th 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 therefore, it is so. Uh, they, uh, these like-minded, they respect each other. And it is easy for uh, them. So I prefer to speak to pe uh, people who speak different languages. I can learn something new. Therefore, I speak French, uh, Russian, uh, uh, Spanish, uh, Portuguese, and so on, but, uh, and English also a bit. Uh, but uh, but uh, most people uh, try uh, to have uh, like-minded uh, neighbors, so they are, it's more comfortable, but it is uh, not so useful in uh, my opinion. So 
my advice is read this book. It's a very good and very useful uh, book. It goes beyond uh, 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 the, uh, these uh, invisible uh, uh, collegium of international lawyers. Uh, so international relations specialists and others uh, should read as, it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And last but not least, someone who definitely transcends nationality. <laughs> um, Marco, one of his many publications was on a book with Michael Wood on the advisory opinion um, of the ICJ in the Kosovo independence case. And I must say, I was teaching, I, obviously that is one of the readings we set for our students. And I wasn't able to tell them really where in the Fort Yugoslavia you, you were from, which I think says much about the international Marco Milanovic we have before us. Right, so, so I... Um, I, I um not only am I a Serb, I was in that case paid to be one because <laughs> I, I worked for Serbia. Yet uh, the, um, um, the nice thing about it is that, that Michael was, was counsel for Kosovo, right? And that we decided to write, uh, to edit a book together that would not be an exercise in advocacy, um, as, as, you, as, as, as you well put it, uh, but would try to sort of under, um, you know, explain the, the, the different strands in the law and politics of that case. Um, so uh, may I just say again just how much I love your book. And I love your book, um, one reason for that is because as Ryan was saying, it, it is essentially a, a, you know, a, a road of your internal discovery of, of this pluralist world. Now, some of us, to our great misfortune, were not born in the center or an imperial appendage of the center. And so somehow uh, the pluralism, the, the fact of pluralism was obvious. Yeah. So for example, if you were, uh, uh, as I was, if you were um, you know, training to be a lawyer in Serbia, the Cold War is over-ish. Because for us it wasn't over, for us it became hot. <laughs> right? And the country fell apart and so on and so forth. Um, it was very weird, right? So, but the, the fact of pluralism was obvious. So for example, the big issue, one huge issue that was discussed all the time in my international law class was whether the ICTY was legally established. Now, nobody talked about it outside the, the former Yugoslavia. But Croatian nationalists and Serb nationalists loved to agree on the fact that this tribunal was unlawful, which, which is probably one of the very few things they could agree on. Um, so the, the, there was this pluralism, the sense of pluralism was that you as a sort of, for example, human rights friendly person were a minority in your own society or legal academia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you looked towards this hegemonic center in some ways a validation of your own um, ideas. Anyway, um, so, so that's one, one, one reason why this book is so, so lovely is because it's this, this for somebody who is from the center, uh, a discovery of pluralism. Uh, and the central message that we should appreciate all these diverse perspectives is I think uh, a crucial one. On the other hand, I have two concerns. And so this sort of ties to, to some of the discussions we've been having uh, on the book on, on, on EGIL talk and on opinion yours. My first concern, probably my more, more really the more important one, is that in appreciating all these different perspectives, we might go down the road of complete relativism. Now, I don't think that's what you want. I mean, at the end, essentially, you say you don't want that. You say, you know, you're free to disagree, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a danger of, of losing an anchor, you know, in, in, in losing the ability to say something is not legal. You know, at what point, you know, for example, turning to Crimea, you know, at what point are we able to say, you know, it's, it is just annexation, you know, and it is actually simply illegal, you know? Should we always, for every issue, try to appreciate, not simply appreciate what the other side has to say, but sort of validate that perspective as somehow being equally legitimate? So that, that's one danger. Now, if you're an adherent of a, a legal theory of radical indeterminacy, that's, that's, that's what you do. But if you don't, if you're not of that ilk, if you're not Marty Koskenemi, then, then this danger of relativism is uh, a big one. 
My second concern, um, which goes to sort of some of the findings in the book, et cetera, and the methodologies, to what extent are, is a lot of your discussion really specific to international law as a profession? And to what extent is it more generalizable to law, to the study, academic study of law, or even to any kind of academic study? So let me turn to, to that second theme, and then I'll come back to the, the, the first one. So issue number one. So for example, if you look at who gets to be an academic, and how, how you get hired to be an academic, what kind of profile you need to have, I think one thing that really comes out of the book very, very clearly is how unique the UK is. And how very few states like the UK with a mo very open academic market you are in law th 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 that you have. Um, I mean, the only comparable places are, say, the Netherlands, some Scandinavian countries, some isolated institutions like, I don't know, the European University Institute, etc. But Australia, I am not sure about Canada. I don't think Canada is like that. But it's actually, out of 200 states in the world, there's maybe 10 that are open as this, so that you know, two Australians and one Estonian and one Serb are sitting on a panel and they could get jobs <laughs> in this country. I mean, you, you will not find this elsewhere, yeah. right? So, so one, one question, one big question is why is the UK like that? Um, how did it become like that? It wasn't always like that. You say at one point in the book you don't want to do a temporal analysis. You want to do a, like a, this is how it is in the 2010s. You don't want to, 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 to look at how the academic market evolved over 50 years because you just can't, right? Um, and I think that's fair enough. But I think it's worth re reflecting on how open an academic market is generally. So for example, in Serbia, if you are a physicist, not a lawyer, if you're a physicist who was trained in England, there's no way you're going to get a job, even if you spoke Serbian. So it's not the language issue. The issue is you don't know the right people who are going to help you get a job. In most places in the world, the way you get a job is by kissing the nether regions of people who are in the position to give you a job. It's not about how good you are. Or it's about how you good, good you are only to some very small extent. Yeah? So I know, I mean, if I look at the former Yugoslavia, I know no physicists, biologists, psychologists, whatever, who are not from there, who have a job at those universities. Now, if, if physics, biology, genetics, I don't know, pick your thing, is closed, then law is definitely going to be closed, right? So I think one big question that needs exploring is how open is the academic market more generally, not simply how open is the international legal market. So there you have these weird examples, which are wonderful, like America, where, you know, if, if you go to a biology department, I know two-thirds of people are going to be foreign. If you go to a law school, so for example, both you and I, we taught at Columbia, you're like the only foreigner there, or one of the, 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 you know, the few people who are foreigners in the law school. So that's not because the academic market more generally is closed. It's because law schools are closed. And the question is how they become closed, why are they closed, how do these hierarchies you know, replicate themselves. Here, it's not simply international law that's open. It's law that's open. So I have, you know, in Nottingham, there's an Israeli guy who teaches constitutional law, a Greek guy who teaches public procurement, uh, a Belgium lady who teaches intellectual property. I, you see what I mean, right? So I, uh, half of our staff, more than half of our staff is foreign. I remember this wonderful job interview where this lady, um, 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 she was, I think, just finished her PhD. She was Chinese, and she was giving this presentation. And she did a very unwise thing. During her presentation, she said, well, you English people wouldn't understand that. She said something like that, <laughs> So, which is stupid in and of itself. But then I looked around the room. There was no English person in the room. <laughs> huh? so, but, so that's partly because the British universities are open. And then somehow, I don't know whether there was ever a conscious decision to open law schools in the way, or whether they were simply carried together with the rest of the university. 
So, so one, one question that I think needs exploring that you simply, you know, within the scope of a project you couldn't do is to what extent are these differences in the international law college a consequence of how academia, universities, et cetera, generally are, are structured and run and so on. And that brings me to <coughs> my second point, patterns of dominance and influence. So you're right. I mean, clearly, if you're a powerful state, your lawyers are going to have more, more of an, an influence. But that doesn't necessarily explain why you know, British people, British international lawyers have so much influence, because the UK is no longer what it was. Yeah? Uh, and why Chinese lawyers or Russian lawyers or Indian law, international lawyers or, or Brazilian international lawyers don't have as much influence, right? So there, there have to be some other explanations. There are many explanations. But one, one that, that we engaged in before is, again, the question of how um, the nature of the, of the academic enterprise in that particular society. And that has many different uh, aspects. One is question of rigor, merit, meritocracy. How do you get hired? Because remember, I actually meritocracy is a rarity across most of the planet. So th that's problem number one. The second question is integrity. I can show you, I mean, we can, we can discuss this, how much, how many plagiarism scandals we've had, for example, in the former Yugoslavia. I can, I can show you how the top politicians have fake PhDs. They've been exposed as having p fake PhD, nothing happened. So there was a lot of noise, a lot of fire, they're still in position. In Germany, you had remembered the, the German former Minister of Defense, uh, Zu Gutenberg, right? When he was exposed, he had to resign. Huh? You don't have that in Serbia. Vladimir Putin, by the way, has a doctorate. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. so? He has a doctorate, right? Did he, he write he it? PhD. PhD, huh? did he write it? Give me a break. <laughs> yeah? But, but you, you see the problem. So one question is integrity. We, we simply don't know. <laughs> I like that approach. <laughs> it's not, I, I doubt it. It's well, it's not like I, I, I'm aware of the delicate nature of talking about this at, at the LSC. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like Saif al-Islam Gaddafi <laughs> with the whole good governance PhD. And then there's the question of academic freedom, independence, and so on. So my question is this. Clearly, there's a, a pattern of dominance in that we want to publish in US and, and uh, European journals, and those journals are going to have more an impact and more prestige, et cetera, and so on. And it's clear that the UK academia has a way more disproportionate influence when compared to you know, the Russian academia. And a, a, lot ex you know, a lot is explained by what you say, you know, the parochial nature of this or that and so on. But we need to do the same exercise for stuff that's not international law. How much good physics is being done in Russian universities today? How much good biology is being done in, in Russian universities today? Or in Serbian universities? Or You see what I mean? How much good social science, psychology, sociology, whatever, is being done in these universities? And if you do that, if you do the type of exercise, some of it is explainable by bias and by, by Western imperialism, whatever. A lot of it is not. And I don't think you will, you will find a gap that I think is very similar to international law. And if you find that gap that tells you that you know, there are structural consequences to that gap, for example, brain drain. I mean, I, can I cannot even begin to describe to you just how many people of my generation have left and want to leave the former Yugoslavia, or how many have left Russia. We're talking about millions of people. You know, the smartest and the most educated have left Russia. And that has, for example, an impact on the quality of Russian universities, no matter what the politics of the, of the situation are. And then you have the question of freedom. How free are you to criticize? Right, so you cannot publish in China a paper that would say the South China Sea doesn't belong to China. You can just not do it. So if you have an academic community that is unanimous in saying, you know, the West is bad, they, they're imposing this on us, you know, the arbitration is invalid, da, 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 that actually does a disservice to the argument. The unanimity is problematic because you understand that the, the, the cause of the unanimity is not the clarity of the position, it's the fact that they are herded into that position. Now, here, on the other hand, 
like it or not, the vast majority of British international lawyers, British or British, will say, you know, the Syrian strikes were illegal, the Iraq war was illegal, and so on. So, so these, these differences, I think, also matter. And that brings me to the, um, the relativism point, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll finish with that. So I think it's really important for us to exercise judgment, which is what you say is the final step of your process. So we need to appreciate all these different perspectives, but there, there has to come a point in time where we have to say the politics of it you know, is one thing, but we as lawyers, unless, again, you embrace radical indeterminacy, we have to say, say at some point, this is not legal, this is legal, right? Sometimes a good argument can be made this way, some, you know, bad way, but there are good arguments and bad arguments. And some of it is a consequence of Western imperialism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not all of it is. So I'll end with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> if it's OK with our panel, I'd like to open it up to the floor. And perhaps if you could respond to each other as you're uh, um, answering the questions from the floor. I've seen hands come up. So yeah, I think I'll start with Kate Grady, if that's all right. Thanks, Eureka. Um, and the, uh, it looks like an amazing book. I, haven't, I confess I haven't read it yet, um, but it, it's certainly on the list. And a bit like as Davika said, it, it's sort of astonishing with hindsight that we were all rounding around thinking we were doing this thing called international law, right? And apparently there isn't such a thing, <laughs> even though we've all been studying it for decades. Um, so, so there's kind of two parts to my question, but I think they're related. Um, the first of which is the question about whether or not you noticed that the kind of parochialism of citation is more problematic in certain fields of international law as against others. And, and that question kind of relates to my second point, which is that, so I, I teach at SOAS, which of course has a focus on Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So in some senses, the politics of citation is perhaps something that we're, I don't know, maybe more aware of than other people. Maybe we'd like to think we're more aware of it and probably we're as parochial as anyone else. But in international criminal law, which is what I teach, it's a conscious, political decision to cite British cases, not exclusively and not completely, but to not cite cases where British forces committed war crimes implies that international criminal law is a thing done, or international crimes are a thing done out there by other people, right? So, so I wondered, and, and I expect that maybe international criminal law is an exception to the normal rule in that, in that it's difficult to think of other cases, I think, but but there's, a, uh, there's something about the way in which the politics of citation works to present a particular other, the core and the periphery, I guess. And so I wondered whether you had some reflections on that and, and whether actually it's not just about citing more people from outside of our, our own field or, or outside of the West. It's about thinking more consciously in general about who we're citing and how we cite them and what that might mean. I'm going to collect. Sorry, that was a long question. Could you introduce yourself? Christophe Bondy from Cooley, a Canadian lawyer practicing public international law in London. So there you go. Um, and I think Canadian universities are more open, but I may be wrong. Um, on the point, I, I, I wasn't surprised. Uh, I have bought the book. I haven't read it yet. So this really gives me good incentive. I, I wasn't, in a sense, surprised by the fact that there would be different political perspectives on different international legal issues and kind of arguments for against Crimea. Not even terribly surprised that there would be different emphasis on different aspects of public international law depending on whether you live in China or live in, you know, um, in other parts of the world. I think what would be, is even more interesting is just different ways of doing public international law. And I, 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 I really want to hear more about that. You know, how is it, and w the one aspect you've touched on is um, what you cite to. So the U.S. will tend to cite to U.S. foreign relations to their own courts. But to what extent is there a disharmony about the actual kind of guts of how international law works, the sources of international law, the, you know, how the system works as a legal system as opposed to what position you take? Uh, Marco Longobardo, University of Westminster. Uh, sorry, I haven't read the book yet, uh, but I think that my experience is very similar to Marco's experience. I'm from Italy. I can say that uh, in the province of the empire, uh, we at least read books uh, in different languages, not only in English. And I have uh, two questions. First is, uh, 
why, since we have so many non-British lawyers in this country, it's so difficult to have uh, different approaches in their uh, scholarship. Have you tried to find, uh, for instance, just uh, the textbook Droit International Public by Daily Effort uh, Pelé London? It's impossible to find it in a library. So why there is no significant differences between the UK and the US if we are full of uh, expats? And the second question is, have you, think, have you thought about uh, the impact uh, on uh, the dominant approach of a certain way to think in English uh, and so on international law on publication policies. Just to give an example, I wanted to publish a paper on is uh, the Islamic State a state? I tried to publish it in uh, English-speaking uh, journals for two years. In the meantime, there were articles published on this topic in French journals. Uh, everyone who rejected my article said, come on, Professor Crawford told us that cannot be a state. At the end, I published it in a Spanish journal. Do you think that this is possible in a country with so many expats? Thank you very much. Okay, sorry. Uh, with so many great points to be raised, I can't do all of them justice, so let me give a few highlights. Um, the first is, as you hear from a lot of people, we are all incredibly much products of our experiences. And so this was very much for me a journey from where I was. And other people start from a very different place and have a very different journey. I think the, the most important thing to take away from it is to not to universalise your experiences. So when I just presented this recently in the US, uh, the question from one person was somebody who said, look, I, I'm, well, they didn't say I'm an American international lawyer, but they were an American. Uh, they, they didn't say I've only studied law in America. They said, oh, look, you know, you've shown some differences in the academy and in the textbooks, but I actually did an ICJ case once. And we hired like one French council, like you said, and we represented a third world state, and we had no problems talking to each other. So clearly, international law is international. There's no problem. And then another person sort of said, "Oh, look, I did my first law degree in Nigeria. I did my second law degree in France. I then worked in France, and I'm now over in the U.S. on a um, visiting fellowship." And it's so obvious that international law is not international. Isn't that a straw man? And I think the interesting thing about that is, in both cases, where you start from makes a huge difference to whether or not this seems like an international and national language to you. If you cross a periphery to core, if you cross an English speaking to non-English speaking to English speaking, civil law to common law, uh, all of these sort of non-Western to Western, the more of these borders you cross, mm -hmm. the more it's obvious to you that it's not international law, which means that if you're in the centre of the dominance, the less it's obvious to you mm -hmm. that it's not international. So there's a very interesting thing which I'm now sort of thinking about, about sort of hegemony and insularity and the relationship between those two. But notice in both of those cases, the tendency to universalise your experience. Um, I had this experience and therefore international law, of course it's international law, or I had this experience, therefore it's co of course it's not international law. The reality is it's all a function of your experiences, I think. Um, a very important point that's come up, and I, I think is right, is does this book just lead to inevitable pluralism? So I very deliberately in this book do not take the next step of saying, okay, so given all of this, what is international law? I think that is the next step we need to take, and it's the step I don't take in this book for a variety of reasons, which is I first want to uncover and then I want to sort of repackage after that and work out what we do with it. I am someone who believes that we need to come up with an approach to international law. I think part of the problem at the moment is that the way in which we articulate what international law is is sort of so high, like general and consistent state practice, and yet what we do is so low and often just Anglo-American stuff. There's such a disparity between those. But, but part of the problem isn't just saying, oh, well, we need to do what the theory is. The theory itself is unrealistic and unachievable. Like, no one's able to canvas all that stuff. And if they could, it, there wouldn't be agreement. And so I wonder, actually, if in the next generation we both need to set goals that are more realistic and try harder to reach them. And in doing that, I think we do need to be able to say that some things are beyond the pale, but we also need to be able to do that without just citing to US and UK mm. and Anglo-American practice, right? So there are, there are both sides there. Um, I have become very interested in this issue about how these uh, patterns map more generally outside international law. I obviously started as an international lawyer working on these, but I've become very interested now in global thought. And so I'm now tracking a lot of these patterns across economics, across psychology, across sociology, across <coughs> international relations, to see what's similar and what's different and what universalizes and what doesn't. And uh, stay tuned, because I think that will be another book. But there are some very interesting patterns. And you do find some countries that are closed and open. And you do find, you're absolutely right about the US, for example, much more open in economics, much more closed in law. And so we see really interesting differences between the two. 
The point about academic freedom, I think, is a really incredibly important point. And it's a point that I'm, I'm working on with uh, some people at the moment about uh, Chinese approaches to international law, and it's not an easy point. There are clearly academies that have much more academic freedom than others, and how do you deal with that when you want to have dialogues between different academies? That's a, that's a challenging issue. The thing I would say about that is it's an incredibly important issue. It's also not an entirely black and white issue. And I say that because I think that often in the West we have a tendency to assume that everything that's written in China is just a result of censorship, and my own experience from dealing with a lot of Chinese international lawyers is that that is not the case, that there's a, there's a variety of approaches, particularly on some areas of international law that are not as sort of tied to the government, obviously less on things like uh, the nine dash line. Um, so I, I think that we need to be sensitive that it's not all black in that sense, but I also think we need to be sensitive that not everything in our backyard is white either. And so I was particularly struck, for example, of how the revolving door between the US International Law Academy and working in the US government back in, back out, I think really shapes US approaches to international law, and so that's not entirely white either. I'm not by any means suggesting that these are the same shades of grey, but I think when we actually start to look at this issue of academic freedom, we need to look at it in, in much greater detail and, and be aware of the differences in the different states. I also think that there's a really interesting question which is about academic quality. And you see this, um, so for example, with the question about publishing in the English journals, right? And you see this in the citation metrics. A lot of the things where we have, <coughs> a lot of the things where we have um, ideas that something is better than others have very strong uh, biases towards the Anglo-American and, American and to the English speaking. And then you use these metrics to say, well, these scholars are better than others, or these scholars get cited more than others. And the reality is if you published exactly the same piece in Italian and you published the same piece in English in the American Journal of International Law, one would get cited much more than the other just because of where it's published. But it's also a reality that what you're able to publish in those places is different. And so one of the things that I'm also looking at in this broader study is the way in which these hierarchies actually shape knowledge construction in, the, in global thought more generally. And one of the results is that certain issues that are taken to be important in these core states become important for global thought in a way that things that are more peripheral just they don't matter, They're, those perspectives aren't relevant. But you also have a tendency to um, universalise your experiences as the universal. And so one of the examples I'll give from this, which I just think is quite lovely, is actually from, um, from psychology, which is that some of the top journals in psychology are all based in America. Uh, they make all sorts of statements about human nature, which is universal, as you would imagine, the human. And yet it turns out that I think 96% uh, of the experiments they're based on... Students. Have have, no, not students. 96% have been done on people that come from weird states, which stands for Western, educated, industrialised, rich and democratic. 67% uh, just come from America, and a majority of those are US psychology students from East Coast journals. So it turns out on a whole bunch of measures of psychology that people from weird states are an outlier, people from the US are, are an outlier within that, and psychology students from elite universities are an outlier within this. And yet they're making all sorts of statements about what it means to be human nature. Not only with a sample that's not representative, but in many ways is one of the least representative samples. But you can get away with that when you're publishing in US journals where everybody has studied in the US and they don't think to ask that question of, is this generalizable? If you took exactly those studies and you came to them and said, I've got all these studies about human nature, 96% of them were done in Papua New Guinea. The very first question someone would ask you is, is that generalizable, right? And so there are really interesting ways in the construction of global thought that these hierarchies make a real difference. And these hierarchies then very much affect our, what we think of as measures of quality, like academic citations, which often have a sort of way of reinforcing these points. I also think that there's a really interesting uh, point about um, the way in which your position on a borderland or a hinterland might make a difference to the way in which you approach international law. So you clearly, Marco, came from Serbia and you really saw, you really saw this sort of uh, war that was going on between these different approaches. Not so obvious to me coming up through Australia and to the US. But what we also start to see, and I was talking to Larry Malkso about this, um, one of your compatriots from Estonia, is we were having coffee recently and he was talking about his approaches on Russian approaches to international law and I was talking with Benedict Kingsbury, who's a New Zealander based in the US, about you know, China's approaches to international law. And Larry made the point, a very interesting observation, I think, that it takes Australians and New Zealanders to try and explain China to the rest of the world, just like, and we made the point that it takes Estonians to uh -huh. explain Russians. And there's actually something, and Benedict Kingsbury sort of coined it, and I think we should explore it further. It, he said it's like the intellectual ring of fire. You've got the ring of fire where the sort of tectonic plates are crashing and you start to have the volcanoes erupting. 
it's, it's in the people who are in the intellectual ring of fire who actually are at the point where you can see these things hitting up against each other that are often going to be doing this kind of communication scholarship. And you can also see in these sort of hinterlands often people who orient in one direction or who orient in others. So some of the intellectuals who orient back to Russia and others who orient to the West and then you end up having these fights about, you know, is the individual a subject of international law? So I think there's actually something quite conceptually interesting about the hinterlands in international law and what that does to senses of identity. Um, happy to open for another question. Yeah, I'd love want. to take <laughs> another round if we could. May, may no. I, uh, um, uh, do you know what, Ryan? I'm going to be such a rude chair and say no. I want to open it up to the floor and then we will hopefully have um, time for our panellists to come back. Uh, so, great. So, Chiloko Bayani, and then I saw you up the back. Thank you, Davika. Chaloka Bayan is my name. I'm uh, in the law department here uh, at LSC. So, Anthea, welcome back. Good to see you again. I think that the, uh, int the Australian International Law Mafia is a good mafia. <laughs> um, stands for the public international good. And Rain, welcome back. I think it's some 22 years ago that we co-taught International Protection of Human Rights. I still recall. And of course, uh, Mark, welcome to LSC. I would like to start on some kind of uh, anecdote that a more often laid claim is that international lawyers think that they're more important than they, clear, than they claim to admit because their subject is not international in the first place. After your book, Anthea, who would you now regard as an international lawyer? Um, the second is international lawyers have been alive to these issues for some time, and I just quote, in the 1915 American Journal of International Law, Pittman Porter wrote an article on Up Obstacles and Alternatives to International Law. Uh, it was followed by Alfred P. Rubin in 1973, another uh, edition of the American Journal of International Law. Uh, and I would just like to quote and then um, wait for your, for your response. A recent book seems to argue, and now we have another recent book, <laughs> that concepts of international law by inevitable operation of linguistic and other cultural phenomena are essentially linked to the broad societies in which they appear. The West, the Islamic Middle East, Africa south of the Sahara, India, Indianized Asia, and China, although there's no mention of Russia or, or the Soviet Union. So is international law a product of the geopolitical location um, in which its intellectual practice uh, develops? And then finally, there seems to be a retreat from multilateralism. What is the future for international law? You spoke of bipolar, multipolar um, aspects, and if you could just comment on that. Thank you very much. Uh, easy ones, yeah. Thank you, Chaloka. Uh, one of our undergraduate international law students who's been subjected <laughs> to our <coughs> decidedly uninternational reading list. Yeah. Hi, yeah, Shukri, uh, undergrad law student here, uh, doing public international law in second year. My question is, quite practical and it's what what do we do because I'm going to be sitting my PIL exam in two <laughs> weeks time <laughs> and, and in the exam we're expected oh, to <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're expected to say it's examinable <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, what, what the law is and what the gamut of academic commentary on what the law is but from what it seems it's not only indeterminate but what we receive in terms of our teaching is very narrow so can it be said with any degree of, for our side, like intellectual honesty that X, Y, and Z is the law and A, B, and C think X, Y, and Z? Thank you. I'm sorry, I feel that we have cut the floor a bit short, but uh, to give our panelists a, a final concluding. Um, do, are you suggesting that you, you I, conclude? Yes, yeah, so. I don't want to yeah. say anything, I'm good. <laughs> so, Ryan, I'd love to uh, hear you. One comment yeah. about uh, Mark or slippery slope of relativism or thoughts. Relativism. Okay, I'm going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, uh, that's true, but uh, on many issues we have to take slippery slopes because there are no other slopes, uh, simply. So uh, and uh, uh, if the issue is such, you 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 have to depth into it and uh, you find uh, uh, yourself maybe in difficulty. And there you, uh, 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 lawyers, uh, or let's say courts, have to come to a, a definitive uh, conclusion often, or always.
uh, only maybe in the nuclear weapons case, uh, the IPJ didn't come to uh, any uh, definitive uh, conclusion. Uh, but uh, courts have to make uh, in uh, uh, their judgments. Yeah, but most international law is applied not by courts, but through negotiations. So, and they are, of course, let's say, uh, uh, take the case of the Crimea uh, or this annexation reunification uh, uh, case, or t uh, take, for example, uh, Nagorno Karabakh, uh, Armenian uh, uh, point, and uh, uh, the Azeri uh, point. I was a mediator in 1994 uh, between Azeris and Armenians on Nagorno-Karabakh on behalf of the UN. I traveled there. Of course, they were uh, persuaded, uh, they were convinced that their point was uh, the only correct one. The Armenians argued for self-determination of uh, uh, peoples. By the way, a uh, new book is published. I contributed also on self-determination uh, uh, just today. It was published. Uh, and and uh, the Azeri is about territorial integrity of uh, the country. So, and both are valid uh, points. Yes, the court, if they go to court, but you, uh, the, usually on such issues that they don't go to court. Uh, so, the, they, uh, the uh, compromises are uh, needed. And I believe also this, your approach was a bit uh, Western. <laughs> I had a, word. I had a, here, uh, uh, not at the LSE, but Kings, uh, uh, already a long time ago, a Chinese PhD student who published a, uh, his dissertation, was published also as a book. Uh, it was about uh, the South China Sea uh, and all uh, the Chinese territorial uh, disputes. And one thing I learned from this Chinese uh, student, and uh, I have been many times to China and uh, worked with him uh, also in China, is uh, that uh, uh, ch the Chinese don't like confrontational uh, issues, uh, solutions. Uh, one is uh, uh, right, others are wrong. So they want to uh, find a way out of uh, the situation. But nobody is completely wrong, nobody is completely right. And international law often works in such a way in negotiations, not in court. And most international law is not uh, used by courts. By the way, uh, uh, I was still uh, probably uh, a Soviet international lawyer when in the number one issue of the European Journal of International Law, in 1990, I believe it was published, I published an article, uh, <coughs> uh, is individual a uh, subject of international law? And my conclusion was, uh, it, it is. Uh, so uh, uh, now th I don't think that uh, they discuss it. Uh, I believe it is. In any case, it would be uh, an issue which uh, doesn't have, from the point of view of a uh, person who has lived and practiced even law in this country, it doesn't matter. This, this is immaterial uh, uh, question. Thank you. Uh, the uh, last Something word. very, yep. much, very brief to finish off. Um, I realised there was one question I didn't address, and it actually looks to something that Ryan just said, which is: Are there different ways in which we approach international law? So one of them I find quite striking is that Western international lawyers have a very heavy emphasis on court cases to understand international mm. law, and within the West, the the UK's type of academy very focused to international courts and tribunals. The US very focused to US courts, but but it's both still very focused on courts, and it's not just. Um, common law states, even, even if you look in the French textbooks and stuff, very kind of focused on, on court cases. One of the things I found in a lot of the Russian and the Chinese approaches and in some of the Latin American approaches was vastly less emphasis on courts, be they domestic or international, and a much greater emphasis on other sources. So you say negotiations were well, one of the ones I find a lot, a lot more is like general assembly resolutions. And I've been taught in my international law classes and would have repeated on my exams that general assembly resolutions aren't binding, so they don't really count for much. But if I looked at my Chinese sources, for example, the, they, they were extremely high. And it turns out that the content of international law looks incredibly different if you basically don't cite international court cases or domestic cases, but you cite general assembly resolutions and treat those as a very significant statement of what a majority of states say. And so there are interesting ways in which just our very approaches to sources end up changing our metrics for how we understand international law and which voices we give more power to and less power to. And you see some of these debates come out in some of the comments that I think have been made. Thank you. Thank you, Anthea. So uh, money makes the world go round. So to finish on a crass commercial note, um, the books are for sale. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
and we'll be cutting a bit of Marco's presentations in the video um, podcast. Um, so this book, though, is available outside for £18. Pocket change, if we know how much academic books usually um, cost. So uh, please do take the opportunity to buy it outside. But I'd like to finish by thanking Anthea, Ryan, Marco, uh, and you all. I'm sorry for those questions we didn't get to uh, for a stimulating panel. Okay, good luck. Thank you.